So far, so good. Let me say a word or two about uh, Pradeep, and then I'm going to ask my colleague Ling Wong from the Gates Foundation to, uh, uh, to flesh it out. The only thing uh, that I think you should know about Pradeep is uh, uh, he's obviously a very successful scientist and proposal writer, which is why we've uh, brought him forward to uh, go through his uh, uh, proposal with you. Um, secondly, he's a movie star. If any of you have seen the Grand Challenge Explorations video, I don't want to say that uh, every scientist in that video is. Are there any other scientists who were in that video just before? So obviously, we've got three fantastic movie stars here, and we welcome them all. And uh, that's just terrific to have such great movie stars here uh, at the uh, at the proposal development workshop. Um, and then finally, there is something I want to say, uh, which is. I don't know how many of you have actually put up a proposal that you've done uh, in a fishbowl to a group of 80 colleagues and gone through it. Um, but it takes a real uh, element of maturity uh, and sharing and commitment to do that. Because uh, uh, as we heard earlier, everything has holes. And I just want to personally very much thank Pradeep for agreeing to do that. And I know it's out of your commitment to strengthening not only your own science and learning from colleagues, but also sharing and helping. And, and so that's very much appreciated. And, and uh, being in a fishbowl is a great thing for uh, somebody to do because it's very helpful to, uh, very helpful to colleagues. So Pradeep, I just wanted to thank you um, uh, for doing that. And then in terms of your more formal roles, other than movie star, fishbowl, and, uh, and success, uh, Ling can say a few uh, content-based factual words Thank you. Thank you. So briefly, I wanted to introduce Pradeep. He's um, one of our first phase two GCE winners. And so he was the fir in that first group of applicants and applications that we received for phase two. And at a point where we were still developing the program itself. And so much of what Pradeep will share about his program, about his proposal, is the process that he went through to get to where he did and pr with the final product. And you know, looking from us, looking at the final product, it, it, it stood out from the rest. And that's a, that's a key piece. So um, I'll, without further ado, turn it over to Pradeep. Great. Thank you, Pradeep. OK. Well, while everybody's feeling so good, I should put in another application, huh? <laughs> I'll turn this off and hopefully this one's working. Very good. Um, you know, I was invited here. I'm very pleased to be here. I did come in the spirit of exactly what was described, uh, try to share my thoughts on how we uh, prepared this application. I'm very grateful to the panel for uh, bringing up all the important points in a very general way about what grantsmanship is about. And what I thought I would do is take our proposal and apply all of these principles and show you how in a very practical way, on a ground level, uh, what are the choices we made as we went along. And we'll see how it goes. I've never done this before. Um, so this morning, what I would like to do is actually uh, show you in very general terms what you will be reading. Because I think giving you a proposal and leaving you on your own and trying to read it in less than an hour and coming up with insights might be a little harder than if we first go ahead and show you what the proposal is about, maybe discuss the science briefly, and create a framework so that you now focus on the grantsmanship part rather than trying to juggle both the science and the grantsmanship. Um, and I've tried to highlight what I think uh, are the kinds of things folks are looking for in grand challenge programs. Uh, is there a key neglected pro problem that needs some attention? Uh, is there originality in the proposal? Uh, is it a competitive application? Is it well put together? Uh, is it a good fit with this particular uh, sponsor's plan? Because there are lots of different opportunities these days to put projects in different uh, environments. And I'd like to highlight that this was a good fit for us. Uh, and I want to touch on something because I'm very sensitive about the fact that there are lots of different folks applying from very different backgrounds, different ages, different countries, uh, different levels of expertise. Are there any kind of unfair advantages to people who are more established, to people who are in Seattle. 
And <laughs> I'd like to promise you that I don't think so. And I, I'll try to point out that, if anything, there are probably higher burdens for certain things. And that's, that was in my mind as I was writing the proposal. You know, why go to the Grand Challenge program for this particular proposal? So I'll touch on all of these. Uh, briefly, we work on malaria. I've been working on malaria for, I think, 25, 30 years. I don't count anymore. Uh, I celebrated my 50th birthday several years ago, so we stopped counting now. Um, we work on malaria. We started with very simple ideas about drug development, that what you wanted was some important enzyme that was essential. We were going to hit them with molecules that were tight binding inhibitors, and we would cure malaria in a few years, and we would move on to working on cancer and other important problems. Well, that framework for how you develop drugs has really uh, not helped us very much. It doesn't have much predictive value. And most of my career has been on trying to figure out where the gaps are in our framework for how to develop drugs. And probably one of the most important things that's come out of this type of analysis is that the ease with which resistance occurs is really important. That probably makes and breaks antimalarial drugs, especially as single agents. And we are seeing over the years that even drugs that lasted for decades eventually succumb to, malaria, to uh, resistance. And when that happens, there are multiple mutations in multiple loci, uh, often seven, eight, ten mutations in more than one place in the genome that gives rise to something like chloroquine resistance. We don't have artemisinin resistance yet in a, in a classical sense. When that happens, uh, it'll be another one of those frightening things to look at in the genome sequence on what the parasite had to do in order to become resistant to artemisinin. In anticipation of these kinds of problems, we thought just telling bad news is not enough. You know, we are optimists at heart. We, we, we face bad news because uh, we, we're trying to move forward. But once you've identified bad news, you want to create uh, a solution. And this proposal was about an attempt to a solution to extraordinary abilities of malaria parasites to mutate and to develop resistance. And the idea was if we knew the mechanisms that the parasite uses to develop mutations at extraordinary rates, we ought to be able to find molecules that can block those processes, and those molecules could be used as adjuvants in addition to traditional drugs to improve the lifespan of our traditional ways of treating malaria. The Concepts, even though they revolve around drugs, have implications for things like vaccines. We don't have successful vaccines against malaria, but when they are implemented, some of these same issues will come up. And people who are thinking of vaccines ought to be thinking about what the parasite is capable of doing in order to avoid uh, countermeasures. It also has implications for other other parasitic diseases, other infectious diseases. So we had to somehow convey this idea of optimism against great pessimism, convey the idea of the fact that even though we're dealing with malaria, the implications are for things above and beyond drug development for malaria. In terms of originality, I think we were dealing with originality both in terms of the question. Most questions in malaria drug development revolve around targets, compounds, and uh, maybe to some extent resistance against specific compounds. Here we're dealing with a global ability of the parasite to change. So it's a new type of a question. Artemisinin resistance may occur. When it does, it'll happen after several decades of use of artemisinin. Uh, the processes that lead to artemisinin resistance can never be replicated in a laboratory situation. How do we study these kinds of processes? And so we had to rig up a system we had to put together an artificial chemical system that would allow us to develop resistance easily under laboratory conditions. Uh, and so the approach itself that we developed was new and interesting. Hasn't been done for malaria, possibly for other systems either. So those are some general things that I wanted to bring up that you should be looking for in the proposal. Did I convey that correctly? Did I emphasize the right things in the introduction and so on? In terms of the application itself, these are the things that you've heard before. It has to have clear goals. Uh, it has to have logical plan and priorities. Uh, you have to have some idea of what the possible outcomes were. Somebody raised the importance of looking at things that you wanted to see as well as things that may crop up that do does not agree with your hypothesis. Facing that up front and saying these are the things that we will be looking for that might tell us that 
uh, our system is not working correctly are all things that are discussed in the proposal. And of course, future directions. Now I say here that this was a starting framework for phase one. I, even though most of you are preparing phase twos, I wanted to just bring this up because this sets the platform for what happens in phase two. Uh, we were already thinking ahead in terms of what we would want to do if we had more resources. So somebody in the audience said, you know, what are the key uh, measures of whether you have succeeded in uh, demonstrating feasibility? And so that was all built into phase one. They're pretty simple, humble goals. But if those goals could not be met within a period of a year or so, then maybe we were being too ambitious about what we had wanted to do for phase two. So we had to demonstrate that those things could be done. And there were some questions on whether that would happen or not. So when we wrote the phase two proposal, again, the people who wrote the instructions ask you to write in your own words what you had wanted to do in phase one, what did you accomplish, what are some of the things that turned out exactly the way you had expected, and what were some surprises. Uh, of the things that were surprises, does it make you change your direction a little bit? And we had elements of all of these things when we got to the point where we had to write a phase two. So the first question I've listed up there is, was feasibility established? Were we able to do some of the things we wanted to do? I'll get to the science briefly and I'll tell you what the issues were. But in terms of general discussion, we showed that the two critical things that we wanted to be able to establish for us to invest our energies and resources into phase two had been established. Were there surprises? And you'll see, yes, there were surprises. The genetic method that we had proposed to zero in on an important mechanism for how mutations occur, uh, the process worked, but the underlying biology that's driving these hypermutations turns out to be quite complex. It involves three different regions of the genome. It involves segments that we could identify within 80 kilobases or so. Uh, trying to f zero in on the exact gene that's involved in the process uh, was going to turn out to be more important, and there were probably more than one solutions. And so the, the biological approach started to slide as a lower priority, even though it was a higher priority in phase one. In phase two, it shifted down to a lower priority, and we started gaining more confidence that the chemical approach where we were going to do a screen to block the process of hypermutagenesis without necessarily understanding all the different components that go into the process was going to pay off faster. So there is a, there is a surprise. There is a strange, in, uh, a kind of a realignment of, of strategies to try to bring up the chemical approach, the screening approach, as a higher priority for phase two. And you'll see some of that. Uh, this business of creating confidence in your reviewers is really important. Uh, many of the points that were raised by the panelists are things I think we covered fairly well. Uh, you want to establish your own credibility. You want to show awareness of what others in the field are doing. Uh, so we try to reference their work. Uh, uh, we, with our own project, we, we tighten up the goals based on what we learn in phase one. Uh, we give more detailed plans and priorities, and we com continue to emphasize the implications of our work. Part of the reason for raising the chemical component as a higher priority was that understanding things is a nice thing to do, but if you ever listen to Bill and Melinda Gates talk, uh, it's about urgency. Millions of people are dying out there Drugs against malaria are not coming up fast enough. We're in a perilous situation where only a few good compounds are out there. If we can find ways to protect compounds that are good, that's more important than waiting for the biology to catch up and then deliver drugs. So we kept emphasizing that in our proposal. Uh, when it came to budgets, every part of the proposal has to have creativity, including how you put your budget together. The budget is an opportunity, again, for you to convey what you think is important. It is uh, the, the Gates Foundation proposal guidelines have a very specific way in which they list objectives and in which they uh, list different key things that you're going to do. We actually rewrote the proposal itself to match the way that the budget uh, spreadsheet was set up so that Anybody who's reviewing the grant could, could quickly go back and forth between what we were proposing to do, how we were going to do it, how much resources we were asking for, uh, and see what the different things were paying for if they go back and look at the science. So the very tight connection between 
what we were trying to do science-wise and what we were asking for in terms of resources. There is a little bit of planning for uncertainties because if we knew everything that we were going to do and how things were going to turn out, uh, that would be a boring proposal. This is about grand challenges. There are un unexpected things that were thought to occur. One other thing that came up in the discussion that's not on my list here but I think is important to point out is we have weaknesses. Our lab is very good at a lot of different things, but one of the things we had not done enough of is a lot of chemical screens, and we don't own large libraries of our own. So we conceived that as a weakness of our own before we wrote the proposal, and we partnered with Kip Guy at St. Jude's Hospital, who we think is one of the bright scientists who has incredible resources, is a generous human being to interact with, and uh, so we made sure that we brought in a partner to help us with that particular component. Partly it's about building credibility and confidence. Partly it's about using the resources we have in our community. Um, I would only alert you that uh, even this relationship where we know each other well uh, slowed down more than I would have expected just because uh, intellectual property people get involved and so on. So it's, if you're going to have partnerships, it's good to get that off the ground early. Don't wait till the end of the proposal to call someone up and say, uh, I want you to partner with me. It all worked out very well. Peter, how am I doing and how many minutes do I have? Good. You've got uh, 10 minutes, and in that 10 minutes, you do your thing and we just frame um, where we're heading next. So okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Great. So, what I thought I would do next is actually give you a little bit more detail on the science so that as you're reading the proposal, you don't spend too much time trying to understand the science focus on the way the ideas are conveyed and presented. Uh, so my lab works on many different things. I'm in a chemistry department. We develop drugs against malaria. We have specific targets we go after. We do a lot of synthesis. That's not an appropriate type of work for a grand challenge program. There was a judgment that we made. Uh, there are other ways of getting that kind of funding, and so that kind of work in our lab is funded by Medicines for Malaria Venture. We have a lot of work on trying to decide how targets are pursued and what is important about specific targets in malaria parasite. Uh, that's a very basic science question. What makes for a good target? That for years has been supported by NIH in the form of R01 grants. We have very futuristic projects on using microfluidics to understand the nature of pathogenesis. What makes people sick? What makes them die? Something that's really not well understood in malaria. and. Uh, one of my postdocs and I actually did put together a Grand Challenge Explorations uh, grant proposal for that, and it didn't fare very well. So, you know, matching what the, what the funders want to do and what you want to do is really important, and sometimes things don't work out. You go back to the drawing board and rethink what people want to do. I don't want you to think I'm a magician and I can raise money all the time. I wanted to put that example in there. Uh, we have a big project on mutagenesis and resistance through the Grand Challenge Explorations now, but we're also looking forward to asking questions of how relevant this is in the field, what's going on currently in the field, and so on. So that's a different type of a project that is, uh, requires larger scale money. So I wanted to show you that getting matching between the different projects is important. I don't have a huge amount of time to go through this, but uh, creating a framework for how people think about resistance and how uh, Parasites are incredibly good at resistance. Need not be sort of a qualitative, hand-waving argument. If you put together some numbers and prove to people that what the parasites are doing is incredible, getting two mutations simultaneously is unlikely to happen in decades. Getting three mutations simultaneously by conventional ways of thinking about mutagenesis should never occur in our lifetime. So when parasites generate seven, eight mutations per locus, in the context of developing drug resistance uh, to me seemed really extraordinary. And we argued those points back in 1997. Malaria didn't have the kind of attention it does today. Now we can revisit these questions with new resources, with new people who are willing to campaign with us, for us, and we can now argue for some of these ideas. Be solid, be grounded, be quantitative whenever you can, okay? Tools, we have, we have tools with which we can develop resistance at very high frequency. One of the arguments in the proposal is that this is amazing. We can reproduce the ability of the parasite to develop resistance rapidly within one well of a 96-well plate. 
when we were able to show that we could do this with you know, 100,000 parasites, it now created an opportunity to go do screens directly to look for molecules that would block this process. We didn't need to understand the biology. This was a major breakthrough, and that needed to be conveyed into the phase two. I'll skip this part. This is the biology part where we looked at uh, progeny from a genetic cross, hoping that uh, we would learn exactly what the genetic locus is that is providing the certain parasites to develop resistance at extraordinary rates. We would have been very lucky if the genetic cross pointed to one specific part of the genome that was contributing to hypermutations. If that particular segment had just a handful of genes and we could knock them out individually and we would learn something about what gene was promoting all these processes. What we actually found out, as you will see in the proposal from phase one studies, is that there are three major loci that are contributing to this. The, the limitations in terms of where the crossovers took place uh, got us to within about 80 KB, 40 KB of where the, uh, the genes are, and we can still figure out how to go about finding the exact genes that contribute to the process, but it didn't seem like it would be the higher priority for phase two. The other screening process was the higher priority. So let's see if all that comes through as you read the proposal. There are a lot of people in my lab who do very nice work, who are uh, very important uh, in helping us get to where we, we are at today. Uh, many of you have met before, and you, some of you know some of the folks that are listed here. I wanted to make sure that all your friends got acknowledged. Uh, funding from agencies that have trusted us to take on some of these more ambitious, crazier ideas uh, is really important. This wasn't the way the world was when I started working in the malaria field. So it's really exciting. I feel like I'm reborn as a scientist again. So I'll stop here and uh, let's see how we do it. So we've got two different groups of people here. Right now you've got the Grand Challenge Explorations and the, pro the, the proposal you're looking at is the Grand Challenge Explorations proposal and uh, that has been funded. For, I believe with the diagnostics it's slightly different. But what we're trying to say is this, this structure may not be exactly how it works for another RFP, but the concept of how to tell a story, how to make sure your budget makes sense with the, you know, the scope of work you're working on, that's gonna be the same regardless of which project or which RFP you're applying for. And it's about you know, how you tell that story may, t may differ and what you tell in each story might differ. But the connection point and how you, how you engage your readers in many cases will be the same, regardless of which RFP you're applying for. So we're, tr we're trying to really help you pull out the, the major themes. In this case, we, the GCE proposal is the one that we're able to share with you today. I think there was a question here. Y yes, uh, so in your uh, objective number one, I guess it's going to be a small molecule screen. Why you take the approach to say activity two and t activity number three, what is the difference between both of, both of them? Because from what I read here is you say, I'm going to screen 5,000 drugs. And it seems to be that if, and then you start, if necessary, in activity number three, if necessary, we're prepared to raise the stakes. That means like, if I don't find anything, I will go to 525. I mean, it's just, why you divide it in two and not make a single one? Just right, it's uh, again the way I think about this. I think, uh, in all of the proposal, I'm gonna take some time later to go through some things that I've highlighted. And what I've highlighted are these constant worries in the back of my mind. You know, if you just show what you think is worth doing and you don't tell the reviewer what you're worried about, all well, the different ways that you think your project might fail, then you might be at risk of appearing naive, right? And so what you wanna do is convey this idea that you have thought about this and you know what the funder wants, right? Bill and Melinda Gates want to eliminate malaria parasites. And so there are a lot of projects out there where people will claim to impress somebody by either numbers of compounds that they can screen or how fast they can screen or how many different proteins they've developed for a screen. You see all versions of this. What we were trying to do was to create a plan where We've thought about all the different options and we're trying to streamline everything into a manageable size project. Uh, stay as close as possible to deliverables that the funder cares about. Uh, and then go to the more complicated stuff if necessary. That was the overall thinking. So if in this particular example, 
we've now got a system where we can have parasites in a well that are not resistant to this compound in a single well of a 96 well plate. We're trying to come up with a scheme where we challenge each well with a different molecule over a certain amount of time, and then we score for whether the parasite successfully develop resistance to the test compound. So there's a test compound in the well, and then there is this inhibitor that's going to block the ability of the parasite to develop resistance to the original challenge. That's a fairly sophisticated assay, and it's not like looking for a flash of fluorescent light. So you don't want to do this with, or propose to do this with 500,000 molecules as the first thing you do. And these molecules have their own liabilities and all kinds of problems. You just setting yourself up for all kinds of smashing on the head by different reviewers. So we set up two stages, first to work with about 5,000 drug-like compounds. And you know this is grantsmanship, but it's also what I believe in. I want to be able to get up while I'm still alive and say, we helped with this particular problem in malaria treatment. I want to start with 5,000 compounds that have gone through humans, that have proven to be safe. Many of them can be taken for long periods of time. If we can find a hit within these molecules, then uh, that would help the project move towards where the funders want to be very fast. Now somebody can say, well, screen with just 5,000 molecules, what are you talking about? So then there is this argument that if you're targeting a specific enzyme or a particular protein and it has a very rigid pocket and you have to be able to find the right binding environment within that pocket, you might need 100,000 or 200,000 molecules to find one that will hit. And we've done things like that for specific targets. The argument that I make in the proposal is that we're attacking a process. The process has multiple players. Any of these players hit by any compound would stop the process. So if you play the statistics games of blue marbles and red marbles and all this stuff, basically it tells you that you might get lucky with much fewer numbers of molecules than in a typical screen against one rigid target. And so that all is buried into the ideas that first we want to do a simple screen because first in terms of just implementing it, it'll be easier for a complicated assay. Secondly, we want to work with compounds that are drug-like to get to the endpoints faster. But if we fail, we have a backup plan. We can go to much larger numbers of compounds. So that was the thinking. While I'm on this, the activities, activity one, two, three, are roughly prioritized based on what I think is most important. It comes with a budget associated with each one. We were one of the early people to apply for phase two. So nobody had any idea how the reviewers were going to respond, how the program would respond. So I thought I'd make their life easier by attaching budgets to each of the different types of activity. And if they didn't like point number nine, 10, maybe eight, seven, they could take that away and I would be dancing and singing if I got the rest of it. So it was set up in a way so that uh, there could be some negotiation over what could be funded. Great, so just to highlight, so the two main big points from, from Pradeep on this is the first was that when you have your idea of your plan, you know, actually being your hardest critic to say, this is the potential gap, or you know, if this doesn't work, this is my alternative plan. Y you, you end up kind of setting yourself up to show, you know, I understand where I'm going, and I realize I don't have the answers to all these parts, but this is what I would do in case it didn't work out. So kind of walk us through that. You've, you've thought through a plan A, a plan B, for taking your research forward. The next question. Yeah, <clears throat> a question about the activities again. Uh, is it at all necessary, or did you think about linking the activities to specific individuals within your uh, lab? I'm sure you had that in mind, but is, was that at all necessary to spell out? Uh, you obviously haven't, but uh, is, is that something that you think is important? I think uh, linking people, so there is a budget narrative that I also sent to you guys. That's a separate document. Uh, if you get a chance, take a look at it. Uh, typically, in any kind of funding agency, they want some version of this. So if you propose to do PCR on you know, 5,000 clinical samples, you need people who are good at doing PCR, who are good at data management, who are good at uh, sample allocations and have experience in these areas. In our case, we're doing laboratory-based stuff that involves some technologies that are unique. And so I did mention that so, you know, John White, who is the world's expert on doing uh, selections against drugs, has already done it before and 
would be the ideal person to set up this. I have a guy, Joe Smith, who is really great with instrumentation, can make machines talk to each other and so on, so I allocated some time for him. Uh, there's a guy called Dan Freeman who is really good at using the statistical programs for looking at relationships between uh, components of genomes that are inherited in specific progeny in a genetic cross, and so he was going to allocate some time for that. I mean, our, our lab is doing some of these things. Now we're applying all these resources we have to this project. And if you are a smaller lab, you would do the equivalent of this, but find the right partners and bring them in so that you can accomplish what you want. Thank you, Pradeep, for sharing this with us. Really, uh, very nicely written. I think uh, I work on malaria, but I found this very nicely, simply written for anybody to understand. I think there was a very big plus point. I just wanted to get a, a feel from you, as since you're so accomplished in getting so many grants, that how much time do you devote on writing a grant? I mean, as for young PIs like myself, how much time do you think, at an average, would be required to put in to you know write a grant in? I think it varies. You know, I, I really am trying to be as honest as I can when I talk to you guys. Uh, I think in our business there is a lot of pleasantries. You know, everybody uh, talks in the idea about the ideal world, how things should be. I am terrible about grant writing. I'll be the first to admit. I put things off to the very last minute. I uh, I found typos in this as I was reading today, and I was so embarrassed. It, um, there is a manual that's been written as a manual, and you know. Anyway, uh, I think the most important thing is I really think about projects a lot, more than the writing part. I think you have to know what you're doing and why you're doing it, for, especially for these kinds of activities where, you know, in phase one, I don't know what the numbers are these days, but, you know, 400 some people apply and, or 4,000 apply and 100 get funded, something like that. You can't take this lightly. You, you, you have to be your own self-critic. You have to think about it. You might even play with different versions of this with your own staff or your colleagues, you know, and they are your critics and they're telling you, watch out for that, why are you doing this, why don't you go do it differently? So the, the thoughts that go into the proposal is not during the writing part. The writing is almost the last thing that I do. Um, but sometimes I underestimate how hard writing is and I really should devote more time to it. Uh, I'm not answering your question directly, but basically I have to run my lab, I have to talk to people in my lab, I have to, when I'm on airplanes, I'm sketching ideas about how to put things together. Uh, so by the time I go to write, I'm actually fairly certain. I've written grants of this size in a period of about two weeks or something like that because I have references in front of me in a file, I have thoughts I've sketched out in my mind. And then as somebody pointed out, it's good to set it aside, go back, revisit it, make sure it says what you're trying to say. Uh, in, this is wonderful. I mean, you know, people are laughing about that video about, from the Gates Foundation about Grand Challenge Exploration, but it is amazing that you can write such small proposals. Absolutely. We recently, as you know, got this uh, NIH grant. The, the size of that proposal was 350 pages. Absolutely. And we wrote it over a whole summer, and everybody in my lab was assigned tasks to write different parts of it. And there's a completely different way of writing a grant proposal. And when I submitted it, to be honest, I don't know what actually went finally. And I didn't want to look at it anymore because you just sort of pray to the gods of grant proposals and hope everything goes well. Uh, on your, this application, you have Dr. Kip Guy. Was he on the phase one application? Who is? Uh, Dr. Kip Guy. I mean, he no. He you wasn't know, on the phase one. He's a consultant you brought in on the phase two. Yes. So in phase one, it was all about uh, establishing the concept. Uh -huh. So we, had, we didn't know that we would be able to do a selection in a 96-well plate. Uh, we had reasons to think it should be doable, and so we had proposed to do that in phase one. And if we got there, then we would go to phase two. So there was no need for Kip Guy for that first stage. Similarly, we wanted to show that the parents of the original genetic cross in malaria DD2 and HB3 would show the kind of difference we need in order to be able to dig deep into the progeny. And so we showed that the parents had the appropriate phenotype. There was 10,000 fold difference in frequency for resistance to this compound, which was above and beyond what we would have expected. And so those were the sort of the goals we were trying to hit in phase one, and that we could do in my own lab. Okay. I just had a comment which I had required clarification from you. Uh, 
in Pradeep's, uh, this, there's a phase one financial and scientific report, and there's the phase two application. Now the basis of the phase two application, all the groundwork, the proof of principle comes basically from the phase one scientific report. So my question is, will the reviewer get to see all these nine pages? Yeah, so the reviewer gets the five pages of the phase one report, then your phase two application, and they also get your copy of your phase one two-page application. So you, we see what did you say you would do, uh -huh. what you did, and what are you proposing to do next? Okay, and just as a comment, I have this phase two application template, the most recent uh, that I downloaded from the site. Pradeep's application is absolutely in line with this. This does ask for the budget in uh, objective-based, uh, I mean, way, and it also, I mean, the only thing that he's done here is that in the project plan, he's given uh, his activities based on objectives. So, I mean, mm -hmm. I think the structure is absolutely. It's been same. consistent yes. through. Yes. I, I think that guy actually talked about the question answer to us. So, I'll, I'll ask a different one. How much reference are you allowed to make within the first two application to? your scientific report? Uh, or should we just assume, and I think this is already answered unfortunately, that the reviewer will first of all read your scientific report before reading your application? So I can answer in terms of this, what you'll review, but I think the question about how you reference and what you reference, I think that'd be great for Pradeep to comment upon. So just so, one, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. You go ahead. I just want a quick clarification. Are you talking about referencing your own progress? Or are you talking about referencing other people's work or both? No, in the beginning, I actually thought that you would send an application on its own. But one of the reasons that I was able to understand your application here is because I started by reading your scientific report. If that wasn't the case, perhaps I wouldn't have understood so well what you're trying to apply for. Now, my question was, while you're writing the application, how much reference are you allowed to make to the scientific reports, especially if you're applying for this before the end of your, of your research, I mean, before the end of your phase one a research grant. So in terms of the actual review, we have both the, you get your phase one report and your phase two, so it's one, the reviewer will read the entire story, so that, that part can be co covered. I think the other component, which Pradeep, I'd ask you to comment on, is about references and how you provide references and when you decide to provide references. And, and how did you think about that in your phase two application? Yeah. So I have a very embarrassing story. You guys think I'm such a great grant writer. I was so deeply engaged in writing the phase one the first time around that I actually forgot to reference anything. I didn't reference my own work. I didn't reference you know, the people in our field. I mean, our work really is new and unique. There, there is nobody else who does what we do. And yet, it would have been nice to acknowledge some of the other people who work in this area, who have studied chloroquine resistance or something like that. And only after I hit the send button did I realize, oh, because they didn't specifically ask for it, you know. But I think phase one was one of those times early on when, uh, I don't know how to describe it. We were all new at this. We were very new at this. And uh, I'm very grateful that it got funded in spite of my big negligence. Uh, phase two, of course, is much more serious stuff. And we made sure that we acknowledged our own work to show that we have the expertise to do this stuff. We acknowledged uh, some of the early people's work on which we are basing the idea that there are hypermutating parasites, and you've seen the references in there. Um, and we just work within the structure. If the page limits didn't allow for that, I can't remember the details right now, it's been a little while, but we made sure that the references were in there because now there's much more at stake. I have one other little funny story to share with you. I bet the world is not like it was when I first got my phase one. I'd never heard anything about what happened to our proposal. And then one day I got a call from the university grants people that basically said, we have a check here for $100,000. We think it might be for you. <laughs> <laughs> so this was the very early days of uh, Grand Challenge. I've been told by many people it's not that simple anymore. People who really know what they're doing have started to run the show. Great. Any other, any other questions? So should I take a few minutes exactly. to point out what I think uh, I, f I went out of my way to do for this particular proposal? Because some of the things we're discussing are things you would do for any kind of proposal. Over the years, we've got 
money from Burroughs Welcome Fund, from Ellison Medical Foundation, NIH, and so on. And everybody has their own emphasis of what they care about, but grant writing is really about what you heard from the panel today. Yet there are a few things that are unique about grant challenge explorations. Um, and so as you write a proposal, you're trying to take into account what you think should definitely be uh, taken into account for things that you worry about. I, I'm always worried. I'm worried about different things. And so uh, hidden into the proposal are these things to take care of my worries. And today I think I, f I forgot uh, you're the one who mentioned that you know, reviewers are talking to each other, and some of them are reviewing every line carefully, and they're probably circling certain things that is unexpected, because they know the standard stuff that everybody feeds them. And so you want to give them some stuff to circle and bring up if certain points come up. So I have gone in and I've highlighted things for you that I kind of snuck into my proposal because I'm worried about certain things. So I'm going to tell you what I was worried about and why I put those sentences in there. They would normally not be in a normal NIH grant where I know who is on the panel because NIH publishes who their regular reviewers are, and you're basically talking directly to certain people that are on the panel. Here it was blind. I didn't know who it was going to be. I don't know what their expertise is going to be. So I, I think I'll walk through a few things. Also, I don't know if the instruction, instructions say that you should box certain things, you should use red color somewhere, you should use certain fonts, where you should use bold, but I'm using some of these things strategically because I'm trying to categorize different objectives, aims within them, and so on, okay? So you always hear that you don't want to overdo it with colors and so on, but if there are some simple ways in which you can highlight certain things, it makes it easier for the reviewer to track where they are in all your arguments. Other funding agencies that don't allow you to submit PDFs, you can't do this. You send it in the old NIH system, it gets copied by a copier that's been around for 100 years, and as a reviewer, when you see this stuff, you can barely read the letters, leave alone any color, right? Now it's become a little better, but this was a good opportunity to separate things out. So, you know, what we're proposing is that we're going to use parasites in the laboratory that have been isolated from different parts of the world, and we're going to test how quickly they become resistant to some compound that we're challenging them with. We have a rationale for why we pick those compounds, why we think even parasites within a single well can do it. Well, this sounds like a radical, crazy idea, right? That, that uh, mutations are occurring at a thousand times higher rate. Because if you learned biology back in 1970s, like I did, you know, Biology was about what you learned from E. coli and what you learned from yeast, and you know that was it. So geneticists tell you mutations occur at a rate of 10 to the minus 10 per base pair per each duplication of a cell. That's dogma. So we're proposing something that might frighten somebody, especially if they're like chemists who are reviewing the grant. So you have to link what you're doing, which might sound risky, to something that they're comfortable or familiar with. And so first in the context of trying to say that uh, Drug developers don't have to worry about this if they're treating heart ailments or neurological problems or even cancer. You know, in cancer, you hear about mutations and drug resistance, but that's within one patient. That resistance doesn't get passed on to the next patient or a community. It stays within the patient. So very bad drug in cancer chemotherapy can be used on a patient. If it doesn't work, you say to the family, sorry about this, and we're in trouble. And then you turn around and use the compound again on the next patient. And so resistance is an issue in some of these drug development processes, but not the way it is for infectious diseases. And you have to kind of bring that out and show that it's important. Um, somewhere in there, we also talk about the fact that, I think it was in the earlier uh, summary section, I pointed out that hypermutagenesis is not a new concept. Your cells do this all the time. When you change hypervariable regions in the immunoglobulin gene, there is a machinery that works on that part of the genome. The machinery is triggered in white cells. It goes in, cuts your DNA in two pieces. It uses an exonuclease to chew back, and then uses an error-prone polymerase to make many mutations within that region. That's how our immune system can generate enormous diversity to deal with unpredictable things that are coming from outside. You have to link stuff that sounds radical to a malaria pharmacologist to something that they ought to be familiar with, or at least one of the colleagues on the panel is familiar with. So they'll say, oh, this is not so crazy. These kinds of things are known in biology. 
So I wanted to highlight a couple of those things that are in there to cr create a kind of a safety net for somebody who might think that this is too crazy. Somebody pointed out that you know, in the phase one award, you're pre preparing a report. There has to be a clear statement of how you did. We had two specific aims in phase one. For aim one, we established that the 96 well plate assay is working. So we had to state it very clearly. For phase two, we showed that a genetic cross can be used to try to find comp components of the genome that are contributing to hypermutagenesis. So we, we accomplished both of the things we set out to do. Now, when you analyze this stuff at the next layer, layer, uh, this stuff, as I pointed out, is more complicated. It may lead us to an answer, but it might take many years or maybe a decade to get to the answers by pursuing this route. This was more direct. In phase one, this was actually a second aim. This was the first aim, but we started playing up the part that we think are the ones to pursue for phase two. There's a lot of detail. Somebody pointed out that, you know, that we had a lot of detail in it. And that's about establishing credibility. We could have just made a simple table that had all the different clones from the genetic cross. These are the two parents of the genetic cross. Which ones can also develop mutations rapidly? Which ones cannot? We could have just put the final uh, numbers on how fast mutations are occurring. But I think giving a complete picture of how we do the assay, what are the time frames in terms of how quickly the resistance appears, the small variations between the different strains, those are things that to an established investigator add some confidence into how we're doing things. We also laid out a scheme on how we set up the parasites and how we do the assays. Uh, maybe I, I have some more thoughts, but I think I should pause here and see if there are any more thoughts or comments on what I said. Yes. Highlighted in yellow, was that how it was submitted? No, no, no. I just did it on the plane it for as us. I was flying here today. <laughs> no, I just highlighted those two kind of point out some things that are normally not in a grant proposal. These are little deviations from, but I, they were there to make a point. And I think everybody's project has some element of that where you, my advisor used to quote an old organic chemist who used to, you know, the, some of the greatest scientists, I think, were the ones who discovered all the vitamins. Imagine what it took back in the 40s and 50s to grind up living things or extract things that caused certain ailments and cured certain ailments. Think of all the potential bioassays for vitamin activity. Think of the trace amounts in which these elements are present. Think about what it took before there was NMR, before there was mass spec, to get enough material to actually determine its structure, and then to finally prove that that was the correct structure by synthesizing the molecule and showing that its specific activity was the same as the original isolated material from biology. These were incredible people. And some of my mentors trained with these guys, and they would quote them, and their language is not always socially acceptable today, but they were right about a lot of things. And one of the things was they always kept asking themselves, what is my enemy going to say when I go to a meeting? <laughs> and I, that's a silly way to say things, but it's true. You're always thinking, what is your worst critic going to say as you present this and you think it through, and if it is a valid thing that stops a particular approach, approach so be it. You don't pursue that anymore because it, doesn't seem like it's going to pay off and you come up with alternative approaches that sort of uh, survive your own scrutiny. And that's partly what I'm trying to capture here. And if there are some things that on the surface look like strong criticisms, but you've thought it through and you realize that it's not, then you might as well put in the arguments why you're not worried about that particular aspect up front so that you're helping your reviewers. Any other questions, thoughts? Um, in, your, in your proposal, um, you've identified a key partner um, for the uh, compound library. Um, but for perhaps a younger investigator like myself, who's not perhaps quite so well known, um, how, how can I actually try and identify potential partners even if I don't actually know them in advance? Yeah. I. Uh I think it's good to start with 
mentors who are older. I'm just giving you my thoughts off the top of my head. I'm probably going to regret half of what I say. But anyway, what I would do is, is uh, contact people who, are, who, who have traveled widely, have followed people's work for decades, who have seen up and coming bright scientists, and seek their advice in terms of who you should approach. And sometimes they can serve as mediators and so on. In your case, young youth. Youth Wong is a great guy to talk to. Um, the reason is, I think, there is the ideal world, and then there are the realities. And the realities are that uh, on a phone call or a quick email, you know, everybody's excited about something or the other, or they might be too busy and they don't respond. Um, but even if they do respond, the level of commitment, the, how much they're going to get engaged in your project can vary. People have different levels of uh, reliability. Some of them, you know, among certain people, I'm considered incredibly unreliable because I won't respond to everything. Or I don't engage with them on everything that, I, that comes through my desk. Uh, I pick and choose what's worth my time and energy and so on. So finding the right people is important. And then, of course, they have to be good scientists. I mean, you want people who are really because when you have complicated data like this, you know, it takes a while to find out whether it's real or not and so on. And so you want people that you're hitching your wagons to that are themselves people that will take you in the right place and not ditch you over a cliff. Uh-oh, what did I say? Keep going. Well, so I have a few more highlighted things here from the application for phase two and uh, so here we again take some sentences from the instructions and I, as I it's again been a little while but I remember the instructions saying somewhere what's your idea what's your goal you know uh, how do you consider this in terms of strategic import well take those little phrases from the instructions and make them the headline of your application it, it forces you to follow a structure that uh, the funders are familiar with makes their job easier. So we're very proud of our idea. And so even though it's been stated before in the summary, it has probably been stated in some form in the phase one. This is such an important part of the whole application. There's nothing wrong with saying it again a third time. And a good idea can often be presented in, with, from slightly different angles. So the, here's an opportunity to again uh, pull out this idea from a slightly different angle. So we talk in, the, in here about a mutasome because what we're trying to convey is this idea that this is not some little polymerase that's just more prone to errors, that creates genetic diversity, that creates resistance. This is a very organized machinery that has to keep the parasite from losing control over its genetic makeup. It only has to kick in when it's really necessary. It has to cause damage in DNA in localized sites and not all over the genome. And People in the field of immunoglobulin hypervariability or adaptive mutations in E. coli have created this idea of a mutasome, which is a complex of proteins and possibly other components that is uh, capable of recognizing parts of DNA and doing the whole process that it takes to create lots of mutations within a region. So we're already invoking an idea into the reviewer's mind that this is not one simple little enzyme. And this is critical for what's coming later. Our odds of being able to block the process improve dramatically if this is a multi-component reaction involving multiple partners. There's no time to explain all this. You use key phrases, you underline them. It's like love. You set it out there and you hope uh, it comes back and helps you. <laughs> <laughs> but we do point out that this is similar to what goes on in immunoglobulin genes. So I think this is unique about the Grand Challenge program. You know, they want your wild and crazy ideas, but groundless wild and crazy ideas is like throwing money away, and there, there are precious uh, reasons not to do that. So you do want to have ideas that are different from, from what everybody's thinking, that are relevant, but at the same time, you, the burden is on you to keep showing that this is grounded. Okay, so the goal is to uh, find ways to block this thing. We talk about uh, primary goal. Again, we're emphasizing that the chemical approach is what we're starting to bet on now for phase two. More emphasis on that. We're not dismissing the biological approach because I told you we actually don't have anything working when phase two was submitted in terms of 
uh, finding a molecule that blocks anything. That's just setting yourself up for trouble. Um, so the biological process, we actually have data of specific loci in the genome that are contributing to a hypermutagenesis. People are comfortable with the idea of chasing loci, finding a target, finding inhibitors. That's a very conventional way of doing things. So we don't want to abandon this in case this doesn't work. Words like malaria elimination is something that's really important. This is what you know, the, the, the foundation cares about. And this is what we work on. So it, it'd be silly not to link your goals with the goals that the foundation cares about. Uh, the idea that we're prioritizing things based on direct practical strategy and not worrying about uh, hypothetical biological schemes that require 100 different things to work correctly before we have a product, uh, that's something that was important and was worth mentioning. And then in my introduction, I mentioned that while we're working on malaria and having a new strategy for making compounds more useful, this is a general new strategy that could be applicable to other pathogenic microorganisms and so on. So that's also worth mentioning under why the whole project is worth funding, okay? Now clearly, again, none of this was highlighted in yellow. You're counting on the intelligence of your reviewer. They're very good at this kind of stuff. When I'm reviewing grants, when I see th things that stand out, I'm constantly circling and marking. I'm, I'm hoping that this is what it looks like after the reviewer finishes reading the grant. That's what you're trying to do. So in activity one, which again I told you is the highest priority for us, we wanted to optimize ways to do a high throughput screen. The fact that we demonstrated in phase one that we could do a selection in a single well of a 96 well plate was really important. Without that, there was no such project. But once you've established that, it's still a long ways away to actually getting a high throughput screen running. There are lots of steps involved. And so we talk about some of the potential problems. I'm sorry, my pointer is weak. Uh, we're talking about certain potential problems of how you have to change media. Uh, libraries of compounds often have precious amounts of quantities of materials. You can't use the standard methods that we use. So we have to make some judgments on when the exposures would occur to try to block hypermutagenesis. So all this is spelled out in the context of AIM-1, what we still need to do to make the screen work. We had a little bit of a discussion on why we chose to start with 5,000 drug-like compounds. And again, that was to stay close to the aims of the funders as well as our own goals of trying to make things move fast. The quality of these 5,000 drugs makes a difference, and there's some discussion of where we would get those compounds and how we would choose what those 5,000 compounds are. Later on, there's this backup plan, where by now, hopefully, we're very good at doing the screens. And at this point, if necessary, we can use larger amounts. If you use, listen, even though what we've highlighted is, is 500,000 compounds, nowhere does it say that we would do 500,000 compounds. That's just showing that we have the ability if we need to. And it talks about going in a stepwise manner to approach this process. As with all science, just because you get a hit under certain conditions doesn't mean it's going to be the final compound you want. So there's a lot of validation. I'm sure this is true of all the things you guys do with uh, diagnostics and everything else. You show the most efficient approach to get to an answer. But if you get an answer, you want to have all the traditional ways of validating that the way you approach this was reasonable. Pretty one interesting thing to note is if you look at all the yellow highlighting. I mean, these are, those are the key phrases that, you know, are to jump out on the page. Many of them are, you know, he has that as activity, and it, it's that first line. So when you you see the, you know, the the subheading or title that you have, that set that following sentence right after it kind of gives you a good sense of where you're going, and then you kind of delve into the details, the plus, the minuses, your plan, but you can get the gist of everything in that first bullet point or first bold point and the subsequent sentence. So keep that in mind. Yeah, so I, several people say they like the proposal and I'm, I'm very flattered, but part of that is, I, I doubt if you actually read every sentence in the grant, what you saw was the skeleton of the thinking just by reading that 
headings and how it's compartmentalized and arranged in some kind of a logic. I, I was just wondering, I didn't receive a copy, I don't know if any of us did, of the budget for this proposal, the second phase. But I'm just wondering how, it seems that activity three is a mitigation in case you're not able to identify anything in the first 5,000 compounds. But it seems to me the budget would change considerably if you're going from screening 5,000 to 500,000. And how did you incorporate that in the budget? I think I did it in, in a time-wise manner. So I, we had a continuum where we, I'm, I don't uh, hold me to this as a legal document of some kind, but basically, uh, I, I remember, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that can be edited. <laughs> um, don't distract me, I'm very vulnerable. <laughs> I already have problems focusing on things. All right, so I think what we did was we, this is partly why we have these different months in there, is we had a certain number of months to establish an assay, to get going, and so on. And then if this didn't pay off, there were additional months of doing this. Implicit in this, in this is that if the first strategy worked, our energies would go in a different direction, hopefully with the same budget. Nobody was gonna take money away if we were successful. Yeah, you can, once you get too involved in this, there, there are obviously holes in it, but at the first level, it's, it really is as logical as you can get, considering you haven't actually done the experiments yet. Uh, so, we, is it okay if I go Let's some? Do you want to stop for questions? No, I think we'll keep going, and as people have questions, just raise your hand. And how are we doing on time? I think we're okay still. Couple more minutes. Okay, so it's the same thing again. We, we talked about the chemical component. Now there's a biological component. Again, I'm emphasizing that I realize this is ambitious. I don't want somebody else to tell me that what you're proposing is ambitious. I know it. And if I think it's really scary ambitious, I might have even underlined this. Sometimes ambitious things are worth doing. This is the format in which you're allowed to do those kinds of things. Uh, so the biological component is similar to this. The, the later part of this is about evaluating the value and relevance of what we're proposing. We're really conscious of the fact that we're proposing to do some crazy things. Uh, we think it has some value. Here's how we're gonna do it in the laboratory. What if we succeed in the laboratory? Wouldn't it be cool if we had a way of taking all these technologies into the field and asking whether this has relevance with other compounds other than our test compounds, with other strains that come from other parts of the world? It's demonstrating that we're thinking way beyond our little lab. We're thinking whether this is going to come closer to where it needs to be implemented. So that's what the last few aims are. And again, they're not throwaway aims, but if somebody didn't have confidence that we were going to get there, I was happy if those budgets were going to be cut and so on. But we would have liked to do the whole thing. All right? Um, and as I pointed out, there were some very key references in our business that refers to people's thoughts on uh, how we do assays, how we think about genetics and genetic change. And that was all in there. Oh. Okay, I'll stop here. Uh, I had a comment uh, in terms of the activity times that you have put up. Um, would it have been more useful from a reviewer's point of view to see how they align, um, you know, in terms of sort of like Gantt chart? Uh, okay. and, and then sort of linking it up to the actual timeline of the project. Yeah, I think the way the budget was put together in terms of objectives and time and dollars, it was essentially like a Gantt chart. So what I've shown here is the verbal representation of the way the spreadsheet looks. But you're right, right on target. That's exactly what creates confidence in a reviewer, that you have a rough idea of how long it'll take and whether you will achieve this or not. And every project's different. Some places, you know, you're developing the technology from scratch. Here we had a lot of established technologies that we're applying to a new kind of a question. So we, we could afford to be a little more ambitious. More is expected of us. So that varies depending on the individual project. So I guess I just make a, one or two quick comments. Uh, first, thanks. I mean, this has been a brilliant walkthrough, but it's really reinforced a few things for me. And one is taking those few sentences uh, just to kind of reiterate you know, what might be presumed to be obvious, but doing it in a way that is, you know, really cogent is incredibly valuable because one of the things as a reviewer is when you kind of get to those last few proposals and you're thinking about which ones you're selecting, you're starting to switch in your own mind thinking about, okay, how am I gonna defend this selection? 
And so having you know, a really kind of compelling description of how this relates to a strategy or this uh, is, you know, ties into reasonable things that we know, um, in your own words, is actually incredibly valuable and it really helps the flow. And then I'd also, you know, really reiterate sort of the, the structure because you tend to read the proposal kind of in phases. You get a, a bunch of them, you scan all of them, you form some pre-opinion, and then you go in and you dive into them in detail and it's that sort of scan that's very useful as a first framing of how you think about the proposals you go. But I think this was wonderful. It's a really great, great uh, discussion. Thank you. Uh, let me just uh, use that uh, opportunity to thank uh, Ling and Noel and Pradeep on your behalf for a fantastic uh, after lunch show. Let's give them a big round of applause.